put up is they don't have a good example of a weaker, struggling spot in your life where, you, where God has used it, where God has worked through it. Any good examples? One in my life, the most obvious one that comes to mind for me, uh, a weakness or a struggle in my life, was when we had our first child, he was an incredibly difficult child. Just the most negative. <laughs> Just, he, he screamed all the time, and when he wasn't screaming, he didn't talk. And we couldn't get anything out of him. He was a very, very difficult child, so difficult to have. And I wondered, what am I doing wrong as a parent? We finally figured out that he was probably high-functioning autistic, and we worked so hard with him, and he's in great shape now. He's a great kid. But during those years of struggle where I went, what am I doing wrong as a parent, where I had to work so, so hard, if I hadn't gone through that, I would never have had the nerve to become a foster parent. <laughs> <laughs> never. So God used that. God worked through that weakness and struggle in my life, and... Uh, taught me to be less afraid of, you know, what do people think of me dragging around these misbehaving kids in public, <laughs> or uh, whatever else might come my way. <laughs> Let's continue the story. Next, we find out a little more about the family of Eli the High Priest. He has two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who are priests of the Lord at Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant rests. Just so you can get a picture of this, there's no temple at this point in Israel's history. There's probably the tabernacle that was built by Moses, the movable tent. And it's been set up for now in the city of Shiloh. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, are shamelessly corrupt. They bully worshipers into giving them the good fatty portions of the sacrificial meat and giving God second best. The, Levit the Levitical law specifies that they're supposed to burn off all the fat and give the fat to God. So they're basically forcing all the worshipers to break the law of Moses. Furthermore, they're sleeping with the consecrated women who serve the temple. We don't know much about these women, but they seem to be rather like nuns are today. They were attached to the temple. They would do things like bake the showbread, and uh, take care of the vestments. And Hophni and Phinehas were using them as their own private harem. This reeks of Canaanite worship and of temple prostitution. So, one god, follow him. Hophni and Phinehas are failing pretty badly on this account. Eli scolds them and warns them that God will judge them. They don't listen to their father. They walk away saying, he eats the nice steaks we give him. He doesn't really want things to change. Yeah, Eli's complicit in this. His story's a tragic one. Because I get the sense, reading 1 Samuel, that Eli was a reverent man and a sincere, well-meaning servant of God, but he was just too comfortable with the, with, with the way things were. He could have removed his sons from the ministry, that was in his power. Instead, he allowed his sons to go on sinning. In doing so, Eli blasphemed God and scandalized the whole people of Israel. If, in case your mind hasn't already gone there, this is the biblical passage that most obviously relates to the sex abuse scandal and the cover-up in the Catholic Church. Eli the high priest didn't approve of the scandalous behavior of the priests below him. He reprimanded them. He scolded them. He told them to stop. He didn't make it stop. He tacitly participated in it. What was God's response? What do you think God did? Punish them. Punish them. Judgment of doom. God sent an anonymous prophet with a horrible message for Eli. To make it short, the message was, all of your house shall die by the sword of men. It means all of his descendants are going to die violent deaths. And this will be a sign to you. Both of your sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will die on the same day. And just to drive the point home that God is about to cast down the mighty from their thrones and lift up the lowly, God raises up another prophet with the same message for Eli. Eli's own foster child the boy Samuel. 
One night, Samuel is lying down in the same room as the Ark of the Covenant. He's got the early morning shift, apparently. He hears a voice call, Samuel, Samuel. He runs to Eli and says, here I am, you called me. This happens three times. The first two times, Eli replies, oh, I didn't call you, my son. Go back to bed. The third time, Eli realizes the Lord is calling Samuel. He tells Samuel, go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. A fourth time, God calls, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel replies, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And God says, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. God goes on to repeat the prophecy of imminent doom for Eli and all his descendants. The next morning, Samuel gets up, opens up the doors to the temple, I imagine he probably gets out his little broom and starts to sweep the courtyard. Then Eli approaches. Samuel looks down and pretends to be very, very busy. Eli walks over to him. Samuel, my son, here I am. And Eli confronts him. What did God say? Don't hide anything. If you hide anything, may everything he told you and worse happen to you. What did God say? Eli's pretty sure he knows what God said. You can tell by the way he uh, threatened Samuel with the same curse. Samuel is terrified. <clears throat> but he tells Eli everything. And Eli says, he is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. This Bible passage is packed full of riches. The story of young Samuel has a tremendous amount to teach us about having a personal relationship with God. We might protest. I'm not an Old Testament prophet. I don't hear voices in the middle of the night. What does all this have to do with me? But the prophet Joel says that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. The apostle Peter preached that this prophecy is fulfilled now, on the day of Pentecost and in the whole time of the church up to the present day. And the Apostle Paul taught that every Christian should seek the gift of prophecy, the gift of hearing from the Holy Spirit, the gift of speaking words of truth by the Holy Spirit. So how do we hear from God? It's going to be different for every one of us. There are more natural ways to hear from God, like through Bible stories and Bible verses, through the teaching of the church, through the counsel of godly friends and advisors, good books through our <coughs> conscience. And then there are more supernatural ways to hear from God, more obviously supernatural ways, because let's face it, I count this as a supernatural way. God speaks through this all the time. What are the more obviously supernatural ways? Well, for Samuel, it was an audible, God spoke in an audible voice that apparently sounded just like Eli. Usually God speaks less obviously than that. It might be a still small voice. It might be interior nudges, the godly version of a gut feeling. It might be praying and discerning what decision gives you peace. It might be a striking word from a friend or from three friends on the same day. It might be a string of coincidental events hearing the same thing everywhere you go. It might also be a dream or a vision or a powerful personal prayer experience. <coughs> Samuel connected with God by spending time in his presence in front of the Ark of the Covenant. <coughs> the modern Catholic equivalent of that would be Eucharistic adoration, spending time with God in the Eucharist. How do you hear from God? How has he spoken to you in the past? Me? I connect with God by praying to saints and applying Bible stories to my life. Other people connect with God through daily mass, through the rosary, through centering prayer. Consider what works for you. 
Sometimes we don't actually go with what works for us in our prayer life. Sometimes we pray the way we think we're supposed to pray. That's a surprising killer of the spiritual life. I, you know, when I first became Catholic, I thought maybe I'm supposed to pray the rosary. Maybe I'm supposed to pray the liturgy of the hours. And those have been good ways to pray for me. But they're not the best ways to pray for me. I still pray those ways. But no, the best way for me to pray is to open up my Bible and see what God has to say to me today. Let him speak through the Bible story, through the Bible passage, and then talk with him, meditate about it. Let's see. Samuel spent hours in God's presence in the middle of the night. Uh, spent hours in God's presence in the middle of the night. If we want to hear from God, we get to make time for prayer. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, the world suffocates our sense of God. We're like the seed that gets choked out by the thorns, right, James? Yeah. If we want to be that good soil, if we want to be open to hearing from God, we get to make time somehow to pray and listen. It can be time in the car. It can be time taking a jog. I, find, I, I know people that do wonderful prayer while walking or driving, including my husband. I, I need quieter prayer than that. I like a dark, quiet room. Again, figure out what works for you. Um, I, I wrote here, if you want a fresh idea, if, I, I mean, I think most of us have some idea of what works for us in prayer, what has worked in the past. If you want a fresh idea, though, consider just asking God questions and actually listening for answers. Questions like, what do you want me to do, God? What virtue do you want me to practice today, God? Is there anything you want me to know today, God? Try praying a question or two like that and listening for God to answer him <clears throat> as he chooses. Maybe right then, just in the form of a thought that pops into your head that seems right. Maybe later that day. Maybe not at all. Will he always answer? No. But you might get a pleasant surprise. It's worth trying. Do we always recognize the voice of God when he speaks? No. Samuel didn't recognize the voice of God at all. Eli had to teach him. God is speaking to you. My husband first opened my mind to the idea that God might actually speak to me too. That idea had not really entered my mind for the first 25 years of my life. Well, only when we are open to the idea that God does speak to us in some way, shape, or form do we actually start to notice it happening. Otherwise, we can explain any coincidence away. Fortunately, God is persistent. God kept calling Samuel. He didn't hang up after the third try. <laughs> and God keeps calling us. Even when we don't understand how or when or where he's calling us, he is going to keep calling. We get to keep our eyes open and our ears open. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. That's the right answer. Samuel lays himself open before God and waits for God to speak. He doesn't let his own ideas or worries or ego or anything else get in the way of just hearing what God has to say to him. There's none of this, but Lord, I am slow of speech. But Lord, how do I know it's really you? Oh Lord, what if I lay out a piece of lamb's wool and you can make it dry on one side and wet all around it? No. <laughs> None of the stuff that you get from other Bible characters. With the deepest apologies to Moses, Gideon, and everyone else. <laughs> Samuel gets it. Samuel is a listening ear. He is a good prophet right from the start. What's the other thing that makes Samuel a good prophet? Unbelievable courage. The next morning, when big, scary, important, grown-up Eli asks him, what did God tell you? Samuel's terrified. He has every reason to be. He's a kid with a message of doom to deliver to the high priest, who is also his foster father. Would Eli ever love him again? Is Eli going to kick him out of the temple? Is Eli going to kick him out of the house? Might Eli even have him killed? There's a whole lot of shooting the messenger later on in 1st and 2nd Samuel. But no. Uh-huh. Why did you say he's the foster father? 
Well, because... The he had two wives, weren't they equal? Uh, Samuel's been given to Eli. Like Samuel's biological father is Elkanah. Elkanah. Hannah's husband. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Who's Elkanah? Elkanah? I guess, uh, Hannah's husband. We haven't heard anything else about him. Huh? Is he gone by now? Uh, he, he doesn't just... come up in the text again. He gets a one more. He, he he gets a couple lines of mention in chapter no one. Wonder I missed them. Starting the Bible, she had two more sons and two more daughters. Yeah, yeah, yeah three more sons and two more daughters. So yeah, uh, just to, just to make sure all of that's totally clear. After Hannah prayed in front of the tabernacle and Eli blessed her, mm-hmm. Hannah went home, had a son with her husband, okay, Samuel. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and her husband's name is Elkanah. He's got two wives, Penina and Hannah. Who's Eli? Eli? He's the high priest. The high priest. <laughs> Eli is the high priest. <laughs> okay. He has no illicit relations with Hannah. Okay. Just to make this totally clear. <laughs> See what happens when we don't start off knowing right. everything? <laughs> All right. The adultery comes later, everyone. Where are we? Samuel is a good prophet because he's got amazing courage. He's got to deliver this message of doom to Eli. And he does it. Samuel relays the message to Eli faithfully in every detail. Incredible courage, incredible integrity. He's got to be tempted to soft pedal the message to make Eli feel better about it, to add something, to subtract something, but no. He did what God wanted him to do. This kid's got no learning curve. He is just, he is a prophet from the get-go. I've had two run-ins with Samuel this past year and a half, which I did not ask for or expect, but both of which were life-changing. Both times he showed up to tell us whether or not we should take particular foster kids. And now I think of him is the patron saint of telling us whether or not we should take foster kids. <laughs> and I, I never thought of him as a foster child before. When I go back and read through the story, I'm like, oh, that's right. His mother did give him away. He was raised by another family. I suppose that fits the description. I'll tell, I'm going to tell these two stories because, because they're fun and because they illustrate some of the interesting ways God guides us. Uh, in early 2016, when my husband and I were undergoing the training to become foster parents. I prayed a lot. One of the things I prayed for is that God would give us very specific guidance on which kids we should take and which kids we should not take. I don't know why I obsessed over this, but I did. I wanted to know that the kids God gave us weren't just random kids, but that he was giving us kids that we could somehow really help. So for months and months, I prayed for a sign. And the sign I prayed for is that God would give us children with meaningful, godly names. (laughs) For months and months, I prayed this. But when we became licensed foster parents, suddenly the rules changed. We were offered no children. For one very long month, we were shut out. We got no calls from the state. We got no children. We suddenly found ourselves in the role of Hannah. My husband and I started pleading to God, send us children. You had us go through this whole long bureaucratic process, and now we don't even get children? During this time, I heard a few odd and amusing Bible passages back from God. I heard the covenant with Abraham. You will have more children than there are stars in the sky. You may not see them yet, but wait for it. They're coming. I heard the end of Hannah's story. God gave her three boys and two girls. Okay. And I heard David's covenant in an odd way. I heard that my children would be blessed by God, and in some strange way would be called children of David. I hoped I didn't mean they would all try to kill each other. (laughs) Anyway, Frank and I prayed and prayed, and our licensing office changed the rule just for us and started offering us children. The first children we were offered were a five-year-old boy and a three-year-old girl. Frank and I have already decided ahead of time not to take any boys that were the exact same age as our youngest boy, Felix, who was five. We didn't want Felix to feel like he was in competition with the new kid. But we had been waiting and praying for months, and now, of all people, we're being offered a five-year-old boy. I went, let's take these kids anyway. My husband disagreed. It was late at night, so I prayed, Solomon, I need your help. 
I don't know whether or not we should take these kids. You figure it out. You let me know. I'm going to sleep. Good night. I woke up in the morning. I still didn't know whether or not we should take the kids. No dream, no heavenly voice. Solomon clearly hadn't done his job. <laughs> so I started complaining to Solomon. Come on, Solomon, what kind of a patron saint are you? I need to know, do we take these kids or not? I got out of bed, sat in my prayer chair, and opened up my Bible. And the first Bible verse I saw jumped off the page at me. 2 Samuel 13, 22. Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. <laughs> Those first two children of King David were rapists and murderers and rebels against the throne. <coughs> we'll hear about them four weeks from now. But reading that verse gave me the shivers. I wondered... Maybe God is saying these aren't the kids he has planned for us? But that was crazy. I still didn't want to turn down children in need based on one disturbing Bible verse. You know, God tells us to help the poor and needy. Is one chance Bible verse really supposed to change my mind on this? So, then my son Felix walks into the room. I told him the situation. Felix, we've been offered a five-year-old boy and a three-year-old girl. We've been waiting for kids for months. Should we take them? No, he said, and walked out of the room. <laughs> I called after him, why not? And he yelled back from down the hallway, my name is Samuel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can take a hint. That threw me for a loop. A few days, and we did not take the children. A few days later, we were offered a five-year-old girl and a two-year-old boy, and we immediately said yes, and then we found out their names, Grace and Emmanuel. <laughs> <laughs> the entire time we had them, I was walking around just smirking and thinking to myself, for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. <laughs> Fast forward to this year. Frank and I had decided we were going to get new foster kids. This is our fourth placement. At the end of March, after spring break, after I'd finished teaching this last class of the season. Then on March 1st, I had this wonderful dream. I dreamed that it was time to get new foster kids, that I was enthusiastic about it, that I was all set to go, and that this was going to be fantastic. And then the dream turned into a more normal dream and, you know, random dreamy things started happening. And I woke up and I went, okay, that part of the dream where, you know, it was time to get foster kids. It was so vivid. Is that from God? I went, no, I don't think so. So I got up and I was greeted by my eight-year-old daughter, Rachel, who said, mommy, can we, watch a, can we watch a super book movie, a Bible story movie together? Yeah, sure, you pick. She picked the story of Samuel and the call of God. <laughs> now, the point of this children's video, that the children's video kept driving home again and again was, God speaks to you through dreams. When God gives you a dream, you need to listen to him. After half an hour of listening to that, I was a little taken aback. Just a little. Then Rachel said, let's watch another video. I said, great, you pick. She picks uh, Daniel interpreting a dream of Nebuchadnezzar. The whole point of the video is, when you don't get a dream, God is going to send you someone to interpret it for you. How dense are you? <laughs> <laughs> After our TV time, Rachel went and checked the mail and went, oh, look, Mom, we got, this, we got this letter in the mail that talks all about this girl who had a dream about Jesus, and when she woke up, she gave her life to the Lord. Like, okay, okay, I get it. God speaks through dreams. We were driving to school that morning, and I hadn't told Rachel any of this, any of the backstory, and Rachel turns to me and says, Mommy, when are we getting foster kids? And I said, soon. Much sooner than I thought. And at that moment, the car stereo spontaneously turned on and started playing the children's song, 
Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. <laughs> yeah. My husband and I got all of our affairs in order immediately and got foster children at the first available opportunity. Five months later, these kids are still with us. I would like you just to take a minute and think to yourself. Think of a time God has guided you in the past, through a Bible verse, through a friend, through anything. One of the best things we can do for our relationship with God is to have a good memory and remember how he's spoken to us in the past. It's a good idea even to write down answered prayers, write down God moments, figure out a way to stick them in your memory. Because when we remember what God's done for us, we're grateful, and we remember how to pray to him. The second part of this question is, how do you best pray and make yourself available to God? Take a minute and think about that.